Welcome back to E4210. So we'll continue with our discussion on link layer protocols. So uh, this is sort of what our agenda was. So for the last two lectures, we have looked at, you know, introduction to services provided by the link layer. Uh, and then we have looked at error detection and correction uh, options that are provided by the link layer. And last time, we were mainly focusing on multiple access protocols. Right? So we'll have a quick recap of that. And then today, we'll spend our time talking about uh, LAN addressing and the ARP protocol. Okay? And then maybe today, we can do one of our tutorial problems, which we didn't do last time. All right, so just a quick recap. Uh, the main problem, uh, one of the main problems that uh, or features that your link layer provides is uh, multiple access, and in this case, you're sharing a link or a medium with multiple users. Many users are sharing the same link. So then the question is, what would be the appropriate set of rules that determines how we share this link, right? And ideally, what we want is uh, that if there's only one user active, that particular user should get the entire resources of the network. However, if there are multiple users who want to use the network, uh, they should ideally get one over N or one over M, where M, let's say, is the number of users, right? So we should share it properly or fairly. Uh, but if there's only one user, then, then that particular user should get everything. And then we saw that there are three options or three broad classes of these protocols, taking turns, random access, and channel partitioning. In channel partitioning, we take our resources, which could be in terms of time or frequency, and we split. So in TDMA, for example, we say, okay, if, you, if you're transmitting, you can transmit over the entire bandwidth, but not all the time. So we give you fixed slots, and you transmit only in those slots. Uh, this is good in the sense that, uh, you know, if everybody is active, everybody gets one over M. But if only one user is active, then you waste the resources given to others. Then we looked at random access, and in random access, we started off with Aloha, or slotted Aloha, and slotted Aloha time is broken up into slots. And if you have a packet to send, you wait for the next slot to begin, and you send anyway. But if there is a collision, then in the next time slot, you don't transmit again. Instead, you generate a random number. If that random number is less than some predefined value, let's say P, then you get to transmit, right? And you keep repeating this. And uh, we saw last time that this is okay, but then the efficiency is not that great. At most, 37% of your slots can have successful transmissions, right? Which is not very good, but it's okay. Uh, so so in, 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 in other words, what happens is uh, with random access, your protocols can be simple and, and so on, uh, but then the, if, if the number of users is large, then your throughput goes down considerably. If there's only one or two active users, usually you'll be okay, you'll, you'll, you'll end up. Uh, the other thing we saw last time is, uh, you know, one of the reasons that slotted Aloha or Aloha didn't do so well is that if I had a packet to transmit, I just went ahead and I didn't care what others were doing, right? So then we saw that one way of improving that would be to, you know, before we send, let's sense if somebody else is transmitting or not, right? So that's our carrier sense part. So before, if I have a packet to transmit, I don't transmit immediately, I listen. If the channel is idle, then I can go ahead and transmit. And while this reduces the collisions that we will encounter, it does not completely eliminate them. We will still have some collisions and we saw the reason last time. The reason is propagation delay, right? You may have trans started transmitting, but your signal has not reached me yet. If I sense the channel at the time, I will still sense the channel to be idle, right? And we saw last time that this can lead to uh, collisions, right? And then we also looked at one enhancement to, to sort of reduce the amount of time we waste during such collisions, and this is to say we do collision detection. And in collision detection, what we do is while we are transmitting, we also listen to the channel at the same time. So I'm transmitting. Due to my own signal, I expect the energy or the power level or the voltage level in the channel to be some, something. But if somebody else is also starting to transmit at the same time, our signals will mix together, and 
After a while, I'll see that the signal level has gone up. So that's collision detection. And as soon as I detect that there's a collision, I stop. So that reduces the amount of time I spent, you know, wasting, transmitting bits which are resulting in collisions anyway, right? So this is CSMA with collision detection, CSMA CD. And the last thing we saw, uh, at least in, in terms of uh, random access protocols, was how we react when we have a collision. So when we have a collision, what we do is we don't retransmit immediately. Rather, we generate a random number in a certain range. Initially, that range is either you choose a zero or a one. And if you choose a zero, you can transmit immediately. If you choose a one, you have to wait a certain amount of time. That certain amount of time is equal to the time it takes to transmit 512 bits, right? And then if you still have a collision, now you choose between 0, 1, 2, 3, you double the window. If you still have a collision, you double the window to 0 to 7 and so on, right? So this was our ex binary exponential backoff scheme. And the last thing we saw in, on, on, on Friday was uh, taking turns uh, protocol. In this case, we have two options broadly. One is polling. In this case, there's a master node. And then the master node goes around individually to every node and say, do you want to send? And if you, have, if you have data to send, you can send. So basically, you keep quiet until the master asks you, do you want to send? Okay. And then the other option was a token ring. In this case, the topology is arranged in a circle. And there's a special packet called the token. There's only one token in the network. If you have the token, you can now send the data. Once you're done with your data, you pass the token to the next person, or the next node in the network, really. Right? And those are things we saw last time. All right, so that was our sort of discussion on, 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 on multiple access protocols. So today, let's talk a little bit about addressing. MAC addresses and, 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 and physical addresses and so on. So previously, we have looked at IP addresses, right? And of course, this is saying 32-bit addresses, so it's talking about IP version 4, right? So these are basically network layer addresses. And last time we saw that, every interface gets a IP address. With IPv4, it'll be 128. Well, sorry, IPv6, it'll be 128, but that's fine, right? So every interface gets an IPv4 address, and then we use it. The routers will use this IP address for forwarding, right? So when a packet comes in at a router, the router looks at this IP address and says, oh, you need to go here or you need to go there, right? That, that's. In addition, at the link layer, we also give a address. This is separate from the IP address. So every interface, so let's say again, if I take out my phone, I said that, no, oh, I have a Wi-Fi here, I have a Bluetooth here, and then I have a cellular network thing here, right? So three interfaces, let's say. Each one of those three interfaces gets an IP address. Also, each one of those three interfaces has a LAN address or equivalently a MAC address or a physical address. And the reason why we, and, and, the, and the purpose for having this local address is, what does the, what does the link layer do? It moves data from one end of a link to the other end of a link, right? So that's basically the job. It's to get the frame from this end to the other end. A link layer address is only useful for that particular link. You don't use it beyond that particular link. And I'll show you how, when you create a packet and you're sending the packet, let's say, to some server in California, your IP address will stay the same all through the transmission, right? It'll go through multiple routers, but your source IP address will stay the same. And the Google server, let's say you're trying to contact in California, the destination IP address will stay the same. But the link layer addresses will change. Let me try and illustrate what I'm trying to say here. Right? So let's say this is me connected to routers. And this is the server 
on the other end. Right? Source IP, something, let's make up one, I can't remember what my number, let's say 172.33.1.1, 1 .1, right? And let's say the destination IP address is 1.2.3.4, made it easier for me. When the packet reaches here, it stays the same, no change. Packet moves to this router, still the same, no change in the source and destination IP address. The packet reaches here, still the same, no change. All the way till the end. Your source and IP addresses will never change. Right? But imagine what is happening at my end. I have all the layers, right? The application, transport, network, data link, and the physical. These were created at the network layer, right? And then this packet is going to be given to the link layer. And then this link layer is going to add the MAC address of the source, MAC address of the destination. So when I create... Of course, I'm going to give my MAC address here. Right? What MAC address will be the destination? Will it be this guy's? The answer is no. Because the link layer working at this MAC layer here only cares about getting the packet to the other end of the link. It doesn't care about getting it to all the end here. Only the network layer cares about that. At the link layer, my job is only to move data from this end of the link to this end of the link. So if I say that the MAC address here is X and the MAC address here is Y, so here it will be X, here it will be Y. Okay? Every interface has its own IP address and MAC address, right? So let's say this is A, this is B. When the packet is going to go from here to here, the source MAC address will be A, the destination MAC address will be B. Okay? So you're, as far as the link layer is concerned, every link you cross, what is the MAC address of the source, what is the MAC address of the destination? So that will keep changing every time, okay? And we'll come back to visit this subsequently in the lecture. Okay? This is just to get you started. The whole idea here is we need to understand that the link layer only cares about one link at a time. Source of that link layer is the source on this side. So if I'm talking about Wi-Fi, source MAC address is my address, and the destination is the Wi-Fi access points MAC address. So we'll go one link at a time. Anyway, let's come back to this, and uh, we'll talk more about that. <coughs> okay, so this is all this red part thing we need to get from one interface to another interface of a physically connected thing, one end of a link to another end of a link. And MAC addresses, in general, for most of the LANs, which means Ethernet, Wi-Fi, and so on, you can have many different kind of link layer protocols, and they can have their own link layer addresses. Not all link layer addresses have to be of the same format, but for most of the things that we use on a day-to-day -day basis, for example, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, link addresses are 48 bits. And just like in IP, we had a 120, uh, sorry, 32-bit IP address, and we took four bits at a, sorry, eight bits at a time and converted them into a decimal number. In this case, what we do is we take our 48 bits. We don't convert into a decimal number, but we take four bits at a time and convert them to hexadecimal. Right? So as an example, I have this IA. So, so this one is the first four bits of my MAC address. So if you want to expand it, this will be 0001. Three zeros and a one. Next four bits of my MAC address are A, which I guess is 1010, zero, zero, right? Then the next four bits are two, which is 0010. Zero, zero, zero. 
next four bits are an F, which is all ones. Okay. This is just an easier way to represent for humans to remember 48 bit. We don't remember it, but at least we read it easier, right? But it's actually a 48 bit number. Now, one of the things you may ask is that, you know, why did we need MAC addresses? We already had IP addresses. Why couldn't I still move my packet from this end of the link to the other end of the link using my IP address? The answer is you could have, but then Back in the day, now IP is basically default, right? Every network world runs on IP. But back in the day, every network was not IP. There was a network layer protocol called IPX by Apple, I think. There's a big company called DEC, which is no longer in existence, but DEC had its own IP protocol called uh, uh, DECnet. So it could be that your first link is using IP, and then the next part of the network is using DECnet and so on. So there's no guarantee that the whole network speaks IP. Right? So you cannot say, oh, I'm going to use IP addresses and all links will be able to understand and, and deal with that. So to make sure that you know, we are independent of the upper layer network layer protocol, MAC layer protocols are used. And, uh, sorry, MAC layer addresses are used. Another reason, right? So let's go back to our earlier slide where we talked about where the MAC layer protocol is implemented. Right, it's something like this. Let's say we don't want to use MAC, uh, MAC layer addresses, we want to just live with IP addresses. And let's say the whole world is just IP, so no problem about interoperability. So what would happen? You remember IP addresses change based on which network you're connected to right now or which subnet you're connected to right now, right? So this morning when I turned on my laptop at home, I had a different IP address. When I came to the office, I had a different IP address. Now my machine is still connected to the internet, I have a different IP address because I've changed my subnet most likely. So every time I get a new IP address, I have to update my LAN adapter, right? So this was the network adapter card, and this needs to have the address, right? So every time I do that, and, and remember, this was done in a separate card so that this can be implemented in hardware, so this can be very, very fast. So I would have to go to the ROM of this guy, and I have to reprogram the memory and update the IP address every time. It's a bit cumbersome. And then another thing is a little bit more subtle, but it, it'll give you an idea about how these things operate, right? So what is the link layer doing, really? The physical layer picks up every packet that comes, right? My Wi-Fi here is reading every packet. It might be, let's say you guys are online now. You might be getting packets from the access point. I'm also getting those exactly same packets. This is picking them up. And your laptop is also picking up every other Wi-Fi packet. Then what? Then it checks, is it for me? How? By checking the MAC address on that packet and matching with my MAC address. If it matches, then that's mine. So then this guy will send an interrupt to the CPU and say, oh, here's a packet, transfer it. So usually we don't bother the CPU. Right? right now, it's probably getting hundreds of packets every second. Most of them are not for me. So I just sniff, I, I pick it up, check MAC address, not for me, discard. Only when it is mine, I will send that interrupt to the CPU and say, here, take this packet. But imagine we were just dealing with IP addresses. Where is the IP address or network layer, right? Network layer we know is implemented as part of the operating system. So every packet I pick up, I don't know if it is mine or not. I'm just a link layer protocol. I don't know IP address. So every packet I will interrupt the CPU and say here as a packet. And then the operating system will check the IP address. Is it mine? No. Throw it. 
So you would be interrupting the CPU very, very frequently, especially in, a, in an environment like this, right? So that's another advantage of having a separate link layer address so that card there can directly check whether it's mine or not. And if it is not, I don't bother the CPU or, 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 the, or, the, or the computer itself, right? You can watch your YouTube or no, probably not YouTube, right? Because that's using the network. Uh, but, but whatever you're doing, you, you, can, you can continue and your, and your, and your uh, machine won't be interrupted. Questions? All right, so hopefully we are hap convinced now that it's a good idea to have uh, two sets of addresses. One is IP and then the other is the uh, link layer address or the MAC address. So let's come back here. Okay, <coughs> so this is what we have done so far, all right? And then the other thing is that every interface on a LAN would have a unique LAN address. Okay. Uh, how do we get these addresses from? There's a bit of a difference in terms of how we get IP addresses and how we get MAC addresses. We learned that we get our MAC addresses when we join that particular network, then we do DHCP, and then we get our IP address. We don't need to do such things to get a MAC address. The MAC address is already burnt into the ROM when the card is manufactured. These days, this can be a little bit different, but in general, uh, the, the MAC address is already burnt into the hardware when it was manufactured. Let's say this card was manufactured by, I don't know, let's say Intel something. How did Intel get those IP addresses? IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, they are the ones that govern all these IP ad MAC addresses. So let's say you are a company and you think that you start a company and you want to make these LAN cards. First, you will have to go to IEEE and say, oh, can you please give me 20 million MAC addresses? IEEE will take some amount of money from you and then give you this block of MAC addresses. Then for every card you manufacture, you can take one of those addresses, put it there, burn it into the memory. That also brings us to another thing. MAC addresses are sort of permanent. If I go on a conference trip tomorrow and I take my laptop to the US, my IP address will definitely change depending upon which network I join there. But the MAC address of my Laptop will not change. It will maintain the same MAC address. In that sense, what we say is a MAC address is flat. It has no structure. On the other hand, IP addresses are hierarchical. Your organization gets a block of IP addresses, then it breaks it up and gives different chunks to different subnets. If you're in that subnet, your address will definitely begin with that subnet ID, right? So by looking at the subnets, I can say, oh, you're part of this organization and, and so on. But MAC addresses, nothing, right? Tomorrow, maybe I can sell this laptop off to some person in some random country, and then my laptop will go there, and the MAC address will go to that particular country. It will not change, right? Another way of thinking like this, I think the slide says social security number, which is a US thing. But here you have your uh, NRIC, right? Your, 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 or, or your passport number, let's say. You can change homes. Your NRIC or your passport number doesn't change. But your home address changes. So your home address is like your IP address. And your passport number or your NRIC is like your MAC address, always with you. All right, so now let's take a look at how we determine a MAC address, right? So maybe we step back a little bit, right? And, and let's look at this whole problem of why I would need somebody's MAC address. The reason I would need somebody's MAC address is, let's say I want to send a packet to you. 
We are on the same land, that's fine. But I need to send that packet to you, right? So application has generated the packet, given to transport, given to network, network has inserted the IP addresses there, and given to link layer. So link layer now has to insert the MAC addresses, the source MAC and the destination MAC. Source MAC, we know, it's mine, so I already know what's my MAC address. So I need to know your MAC address. I know your IP address, but I don't know your MAC address. Right? So how will I do that? In order to do that, there is this protocol called Address Resolution Protocol, or ARP. And what ARP will do is, it will allow you to figure out how you find uh, somebody's MAC address. In general, once I find somebody's MAC address, I may, be, I may want to reuse it after a while. So what every host does is it maintains a table called an ARP table. And this table is sort of like your translator. Ah, this IP address, this is the MAC address. Okay? So there's a, there's a mapping there. And since IP addresses are never constant, right, it may be that this, after I leave this room, my IP address may be given to somebody else. So then the mapping between the IP address and their hardware or MAC address will change. So usually it will have three, three entries. All right, what is the IP address? What is the corresponding MAC address? And how long is this mapping valid for? Right, three things. And TTL is basically the time to live. So this is different from the IP TTL. This, is, this will be saying 50 seconds or five hours, something. And this mapping will be valid only for this. So how will this thing work? Okay. So maybe I'll, I'll show you using this guy here. So let's just say I have four hosts. Right. And here is the ARP table for host A. Uh, it says, how am I writing it? IP, MAC, PTL. Right. And let me give some IP addresses to these guys. So this is, let's say, 1.1.1.1. This is 1.1.1.2. This is 1.1.1.3. 1.1.1.4. Right? Let's say I have given these four MAC addresses. And, and these are all part of the same network. They can, they're directly connected to each other. Maybe through Ethernet, maybe through Wi-Fi or whatever. Right? Uh, let me say, okay, this is the interface that's connecting them. And let me give them also some... MAC address. Let's say this is AA. Let's say all AAs. This is the MAC address. This is all Bs. This is all Cs. And let's say this is all these, just to make my life easy. Okay, these are the MAC addresses. So now this guy has gotten a packet, and it needs to, let's say, go to 1.1.1.3. So source IP, 1.1.1.1. Destination IP. 1.1.1.3. So network layer has put these things in. And now it has given to the data link layer or the link layer, whatever you want to call it. So this guy needs to insert the source MAC and the destination MAC. Source MAC, I know. It's all Ds. What is the destination MAC? In order to put in the destination MAC, we're going to refer to our ARP table. Okay. 
So I'm going to look in here and see, okay, where is 1.1.1.3? So right now, I just booted up my machine. My op table is completely empty. Nothing is there. So what do I have to do? I have to do what is called an ARP discovery. In order to do that, I'm going to put in a network. So, in, so let me just show you here quickly, then we'll, we'll do this, uh, illustrate this. So I want to find out what's your IP address, uh, sorry, what's your MAC address. What I will do is first I will broadcast an ARP query packet. And when I broadcast this, the MAC address that I will use is all Fs. That means all ones. So every adapter in the network will pick up this ARP query and think it's mine. Hey, there's a special address, so every guy will pick it up. All the hosts will pick it up. And then they will give it to their ARP protocol that's running on every host. Each host will see, okay, you are looking for 1.1.1.3. Am I 1.1.1.3? So this is what is happening here. Let's say after the broadcast. Maybe I made it too messy here, right? So I send a broadcast which goes here. It goes here. It also goes here, right? It goes to everybody. And it says, are you 1.1.1.3? Are you 1.1.1.3? And the MAC address here, which was used, was all Fs. So this guy picks up, this guy picks up, this guy picks up. And then this guy checks, looking for 1.1.1.3. Am I 1.1.1.3? No. So this will not worry about it anymore. This guy will check, am I 1.1.1.3? No. So this guy's ARP protocol will not reply anymore. This guy will check, and here it matches. Right? So now, this guy will send a reply back. And then the reply would look something like this. It will just say, uh, you know, I am... 1.1.1.3, and my MAC address is all these. Okay. So the reply that is going back will say, I am 1.1.1.3, and my MAC address is all these. And this is sent unicast, so it will come here, and this guy can now update its table. to say 1.1.1.3 is all Bs, and maybe this is valid for, I don't know, 3600 seconds, some number. Okay. So now we have come, done our ARP query and ARP reply. We sent a broadcast out in the network. We got the reply from the real owner. So now I am able to update my ARP table. Now I can go back to my original packet, put in the correct MAC address and send it out in the network. Okay. Next time, if I get another packet for 1.1.1.3, I don't need to do this ARP query again. I can directly go to my ARP table and then pick up from there. So let's go here. So if you wanted to look at the ARP table in your machine, you can do ARP minus A. And currently, this is what it shows me. Okay. So currently, these are the IP addresses it knows. And these are the corresponding physical addresses or the MAC addresses. And then 
instead of TTL, so, 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 so some of the way, so TTL is definitely involved in, in this, but it's not showing me in, 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 in this one. It just says whether the mapping is static or dynamic. So, so these days you can have two, two things in your map, map, ARP table. Some of them can be dynamic, means they change. Some of them may be hard-coded. Sometimes certain routers and so on. So there have been many cyber attacks over the last 20, 25 years. The number of cyber attacks is increasing, right? So imagine here. If I go back here, everything was normal. Everybody was honest. So these guys did not reply to that ARP. Right? They just checked their IP address, and they did not reply. They saw it didn't match. But if they were malicious, they could have replied back saying some random number, right? They could have sent back a reply saying, oh, the MAC address for this is a, B, one, two, something, something like that, right? And then you would have an incorrect entry in your ARP table. This is also something called ARP poisoning, one version of ARP poisoning. So sometimes for routers and so on, we don't want this to happen. So sometimes we give them static Map IP, so, so the mapping between the IP address and the MAC address can be static. So they never change. Here are some examples of those. Most of them you know, are actually for multicasting and other things, but we, 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 we're not getting into that in this module. But this basically says, this basically gives you an example of what the ARP table looks like in my computer. So one of the good things about ARP is that it is plug and play. You don't have to worry about anything. Uh, the ARP table builds itself on its own. Whenever I experience a packet going to an IP address for which I don't know the answer, I just automatic, my computer automatically generates an ARP query, gets a reply back, builds up the table. And so we don't need to worry about keying in things, so, so network administrators like that, usually. All right, so now that we have looked at it, uh, let me, let's go back uh, and, and, and uh, look through a couple of examples that will tell us how, uh, give us a bit more insight into how, how this works, right? so we'll, we'll reinforce that. So let's take this example. We have a network. Here there are you know, four hosts. We are marking only two of them, A and B. And then there's a router in between. Okay? So this is a subnet here. Oops, sorry. Uh, pen here. So this is one subnet, and this is another subnet. Right? So what we assume is that these, these three interfaces here, they are directly connected to each other. Directly means they don't have to go through a router to connect to somebody else, uh, to, to each other. But if A wants to talk to B, it has to go through this particular router. Okay? But if A wants to talk to C, uh, well, this particular node, it doesn't have to go through this router. It can directly talk to each other. Right? Another thing that uh, you can notice here, that this router has two interfaces. Each interface has a separate IP address and a, sep and a different MAC address. The IP address on this interface has the same subnet ID on this side. And the, IP and the interface on this side has the same IP address as the subnet on this side. No such thing about the MAC addresses. MAC addresses are flat. They're, they're sort of like random. There's no, 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 no hierarchy to it. Okay. So let's say A knows uh, B's IP address, and A also knows the IP address of the first router R. Then you may say, how does A know the f address of the first router R? This is also through... DHCP, right? So when you go to a network and you get your IP address, 
the DHCP server also tells you who is the router you're connected to. So those things you have gone through, I, R. And let's say A also knows R's MAC address. How? Through ARP. Okay, so these are some things we'll assume, that A knows the IP address of R, and A knows the MAC address of R. By the way, when I say A knows R's MAC address, it only knows for this particular interface. It doesn't know for this. A will only know the interface on the network that it is connected to. So A knows our IP address is 222.222.222.220, and the, sorry, sorry, mistake, <laughs> I am reading wrong. So A only knows our IP is 111.111.111.110, and the MAC address is E6, something like that. A has no idea about 222. Similarly, if you look at B, this guy, this one will also know that there's a default gate, or, or, or it's, it's, its router is this guy, and it only knows R as 222.222.222.220, and as far as B is concerned, R's MAC address is this. 1A23, F9, CD, and so on. Okay, having said that, now let's move and see what happens when A wants to send some packet to B, right? So, upper layers have generated the packet, and when the packet comes to the network layer, we put in the source and destination IP addresses. So, A is sending. So the source IP address is 111.111.111 and so on. And A is sending to B, so that's going to say 222.222.222. Right? So at the network layer, what am I going to do? I'm going to consult my forwarding table and see, okay, I need to send the packet to 222.222.222. How? How do I send that, right? And if I go back here to my own computer, I can look up my own IP address to, uh, sorry, I can look up my routing table. I, my computer also has a routing table. I can do this command called netstat. And this is my routing table. Let's look at the IPv4 because that's easier to understand. And these are the things it says. These are the different destinations. Ah, you want to go to this particular destination? You can directly send it. It's directly on the link. You're directly connected to it. it means it's on the same network as you. You want to send, let's say, a broadcast? All once is a broadcast IP address, right? So you want to do a broadcast? You just send it directly on the link, and that's it. You don't need to worry about sending it to any router or something. And last time, when we were doing this uh, DHCP, I said, when I join a network, I don't have an IP address. So in DHCP, what was my temporary IP address at the time? I was using 0.0.0.0, .0 right? So at that time, 0.0.0.0 indicated that I don't have an IP address. When it comes to routing tables like this, 0.0.0.0 has another meaning. It means everything else, right? Anything else. So what it says is anything that we don't know specifically, which is not in that list. We need to send to this particular guy. This is the address of the next router. Okay. So in my thing here, so remember this 172.24.192.1. So this guy would also have a table 
For some, it will say, oh, you're directly connected. For some others, so for example, for B and so on, it would say 111111111.110. So this particular IP address in this figure, the equivalent for me is this guy, the address of the router. So for certain things, I'm directly connected. They're on the link. And for something else, I will send to a default gateway or a router that I'm connected to. Right? What are all of these things? There are some, you know, um, so for example, the things that are belonging with 224, uh, these are used for multicasting. We never talked about multicasting, so, so there are those things. Uh, these things that belong, begin with 127.0.0.1, uh, that's something called a loopback address. Sometimes I want to send packets to myself, maybe for testing or some, some other reasons. So those are, but, but yeah, I, I, I'm just mentioning that just in case you're curious what, what those guys meant, but anyway. So, so the important thing what we want to see here is that we will have a routing table like this, some entries like this, and for everything else which we don't know, there will be some gateway. Okay. So now let's come back here. Okay. So the network layer has generated this packet. Now, I consult my routing table. I'm A, I consult my routing table. And I say, I need to go to 222.222.222. My routing table will tell me, you need to go via 111.111.110. That's what my routing table will tell me. Okay. So as far as the link is concerned, I need to transfer from, oops, I need to transfer from here to here. What is this guy's MAC address? I'm going to go to my ARP table. The ARP table will tell me that the MAC address here is E6, E9, 00, and so on. So at the link layer, I will say the source MAC is me and the destination MAC is E6, E9, 0, 0, which corresponds to router R. And then this packet will be sent over the link here and it comes to the router. And this interface of the router will pick up the packet. Give it up to the link layer. Link layer will say, oh, here is a packet, wants to go to this particular destination. Am I that guy? Yes, I am that guy. So it's my packet. So the link layer's job is done. It's going to remove all link layer headers and give it to the upper layer which is the network layer. Right? So network layer gets it. Network layer says, oh, where do you want to go? You want to go to 222, 222, 222. So this router will also have a forwarding table. Right? This router has a forwarding table. The router will consult its forwarding table. For 222, 222, what do I do? And just like in my computer, I'm not switching back again, it will probably say, oh, you're directly connected. And, okay, maybe I should switch because I didn't talk about one thing there. You are directly connected. But then for this particular router, am I directly connected here or am I directly connected here? Directly connected doesn't tell me much, right? I have two places where I can be connected. Which one? So again, if I go back to my routing table, it says, oh, you want to go here? 
this is the next hop. This is the router you want to go. But which of your interfaces should you use? It says you use this particular interface. Right? So if I were to go back to a similar thing at the router there, so let me say 222.222.222.222. Two twenty, right? This is at the router. It will say, if I look at gateway, it will probably say on link, and then interface. And that interface here is going to say, oh, sorry, you're going to this. So a similar thing there. The routing table at the at the at the router will say, oh, you want to go to 222, 222, 222, this. What is the next router you need to send? You, when there's no next router, we are on link. But amongst these two interfaces that I have, which one should I use? I should use the interface 222, 222, 222, 220. So now the router knows for this particular packet that I have received, it wants to go to 222, 222, and so on. It needs to go out. Look at the routing table. Uh, ends in 222. This one will say on link. And then the interface that I need to go will be here. That's what it says. So now the router knows oh, I can directly send it on this particular link. So it's going to send it out, give to the lower layer. And now this is the beginning of the link, and this is the end of the link. So the MAC address will change to this for the source, and the MAC address will change to this for the destination. Right? So every link you cross, the source and destination MACs will always change. But the source and destination IP will never change. So then you, you, you send it this particular packet out, and here it will check this is the MAC of the destination. Is it mine? It will say, yes, it is mine. Actually, this packet, for all we know, probably also goes here, but this node will check its MAC with the destination MAC, and then there is no match, so it will throw it away. But this particular node B will say that there is a match, and then it will give to the upper layer, but when it gives to the upper layer, it's gonna strip away all the MAC layer headers. So the network layer will only get the part with just the IP addresses and so on. Any questions? All right. Okay, so, so that's sort of our uh, discussion on the link layer. And uh, what we did in this part is we looked at, uh, you know, some of the principles behind link layer services. Uh, and then we looked at, uh, uh, we spent a bit of time talking about uh, broadcast channels and multiple access. And today we spent some time talking about link layer addressing. So uh, maybe what we can do is maybe we stop here and then do some of the tutorial problems. I don't know how much time we will have, but let me at least start off with tutorial 3A and then try to do this problem, right?
So problem one, one of three assays, consider a TCP Reno, one that implements fast retransmit and recovery connection uh, that has exactly 50 packets to send. And assume that during transmission, exactly four packets are lost, the fourth, fifth, 22nd, and 48th. And no other losses occur. And what we need to do is we need to plot the evolution of the congestion window as each segment is sent. And we assume that the timeout value is 2RTT, where RTT represents the round trip time. And it also says do not inflate the window due to duplicate acts, right? And we assume that out-of-sequence packets are saved at the receiver. So what is this? Uh, so, so everything is clear here, ex well, straightforward, except this part about, you know, do not inflate the window due to duplicate acts. This is just to make your life a little bit easier, uh, because if you remember your uh, uh, transport layer protocol, uh, this was sort of our state diagram, right? And the basic idea was that if you get three duplicate acknowledgments, you reduce your threshold by half, and you also reduce your congestion window by half. But every duplicate acknowledgment that you get, right, if you get a duplicate acknowledgment, you were allowed to increase your window by one temporarily. Right? So this is just to you know, utilize the network's resources very, very efficiently. Small hacks to, 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 to improve you know, squeeze out the last remaining juice out of the network, essentially, right? Uh, it, it was to give you an idea that, oh, one, you're getting duplicate acknowledgments. That means some of the networks are leaving the network, so you have room in the network to push in more packets, right? So temporarily, you increase your window, but as soon as you get a new acknowledgment, you forget about all these, and you say your window is equal to the slow start threshold. Right? So we are sort of ignoring this, increasing the window by one every time. So, so, so let, let me show you what, what kind of impact that makes, and just, just to keep uh, sort of focus on the main important issues here, we are not focusing on these small, tiny things. All right. So what we will do is we will basically plot how many packets we send every time. Okay, that's the whole idea. And we will start off with slow start. So the way I will do this is I'm going to say this is the source and this is the destination. Right? And we start off initially sending packet 1. Right? My window is 1 initially. And then only, pa oops, sorry, you are not seeing the thing, right? So this is what you got to see. So I have a source and I have a destination. And initially, and does it say what my slow start threshold is initially? It doesn't say, right? So it doesn't matter. So I should have... I don't know what this is. I don't say anything. So let's just assume something doesn't won't make a difference. Let's say it's 64. And initially, my congestion window is 1, right? So I can only send. We're doing slow start. So I send packet number 1. And only packets 4, 5, 22, and 48 are lost according to, the, according to the problem. So packet number one, no problems. So I should get an acknowledgement back, and this should say, give me two. Right? So if I were to plot the evolution of my congestion window as a function of time, I say initially, my window was one, right, when I started. And at the time, I just sent packet number one. Okay. All right. So when I get this acknowledgement, my condition will 
window will become two, right? And slow start for every acknowledgement I get, I increase my window by one. So next time, I will send packet two. I will send packet three. And then I get two acknowledgements back. This will say give me three. This will say give me four. And now my congestion window has become four. Right? So second time around, my window was two, and I sent packets two and three. So like this. Here I send four, five, six, and seven. Right? Uh, which one is lost? The fourth packet is lost. So this one will never reach, right? Packet number four will never reach. Mm. So why do I have uh... hang on gives me two, gives me three, gives me four. Well I have a timeout here. I'm just trying to understand why did I write a timeout in my solution. It doesn't look like I should have a Oh, fourth and fifth also is lost, sorry, that's why. These two are lost, right? Okay, fine. So when packet number six is received, I will keep six, I will keep seven, fine. But when packet number six is received, this is out of sequence. So what am I going to say? Give me four. Right? So this is my first duplicate act. Previously, I have received an acknowledgement for four here. When packet seven is received, I will get another acknowledgement saying, give me four. So that's my second duplicate act. Now, my window here was four. I could send four packets. And I send these four, five, six, and seven. But my window cannot slide any forward, right? Because I have not received the acknowledgement for four yet. So my window is stuck. So I cannot retransmit anymore. And my third duplicate acknowledgement is never going to come because I cannot send packet number eight. So what's going to happen? After, let's say, two round trip times, I have a timeout. Right? Three duplicate acts are not going to happen in this case. So when I have a timeout, I will send packet four. I will retransmit packet four. And when we have a timeout, my window goes down to one. Right? And let me show you here.
What about my slow start threshold? What will it be? Anybody wants to guess? Slow start threshold will be half of what the congestion window was when the loss occurred. When the loss occurred, my congestion window was four. So my slow start threshold will be four divided by two, which is two. So now I have updated this. So let me go back to my thing here. So then I moved up to four. And here I was allowed to send four, five, six, and seven. But then in the next time, my window did not move. So I stayed here. And then after another, so this is, let's say, this was at t equals 1, at least in this particular figure. This is at 2. This is at 3. This is at 4. This is at 5, right, in terms of time. So at 4, nothing happened. And at 5, I went down to 1. And I retransmitted. Back at number four, maybe here I should use a different color. Come down to one, and I retransmit four. Okay. So I sent four, and this time it is received correctly. So I'm going to get an acknowledgement, and this is going to say 5. Now this is a timeout. That means I'm doing slow start after the timeout. So every acknowledgement will increase my window by 1. So I started my window at 1. I got this acknowledgement my window will become two now. And it's okay because my slow start threshold is also two, so I, I, can, I can increase. And this time, I'm allowed to send two packets. So I'm going to send five, of course, and I'm also going to send six. Now you may say, why am I sending six? I sent six previously. And it was received correctly. Yes, it was received correctly. And it is being stored at this end. But the sender, the source, has no way of knowing that 6 has been received. All it knows is the receiver is looking for 5 right now. It doesn't say anything whether it's also looking for 6 or 7 or 8. So all the sender can do is proceed in sequence. So it has to send five, and then it will send six. Right? Now when five is reached, received, now this guy knows, oh, I have already received six and seven. So this guy is going to come back and say, give me uh, eight. Right, because 6 and 7 are already here. 6 is received. It will also say, give me 8. Right. Now, you receive two acknowledgments. You send two packets, you got two acknowledgments. What should happen? My slow start threshold right now is at 2. My window is already at 2. So next time, I should be increasing linearly, right? So 1 every round trip time. So this time around, congestion window will become 3 because I have already hit my slow start threshold.
So what am I going to send now? I'm going to send 8, I'm going to send 9, I'm going to send 10. And these are OK. So this will say give me 9, this will say give me 10, this will say give me 11. So now I got all three packets here, three acknowledgements here. So my congestion window will become four now. Right? So now I will send four packets. 12, 13, 14, and 15. And I will get four acknowledgements. This will say give me 13, 14, 15, and 16. And my congestion window will increase, and it will become 5. So I will send... 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. And I will get five acknowledgments, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. And my congestion window will become, hang on, maybe I have made a, I have increased somewhere too fast, is it? 8, 9, 10. Yep, this is, um, sorry, I made a mistake here, right? I sent 8, 9, 10. Next time I should have sent 11, 12, 13, and 14. And then I would send 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19 here. Right, so maybe I'll, 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 I'll draw it correctly on my figure here. So next time my window is 2, and I was allowed to send 5 and 6. Then my window is 3, and I sent 8, 9, and 10. Then it became 4. I sent 11, 12, 13, and 14. Then I sent 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. And so I think we have gone so far. And my window is 6. And now I send 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, and 25. But packet number 22 is lost. That's what the problem tells us. Okay. And if I look at the acts, this said 16, this said 17, 18, 19, and 20. All right, now we'll pay a bit more attention to the acts. When packet number 20 is received, act will say, give me 21. When 21 is received, it will say, give me 22. Right? 22 is never received. Now, packet number 23 is received. This will still say, give me 22. For packet 24, it will say, give me 22. For packet 25, it will also say, give me 22. So this is my third duplicate act. Right. So if I were to continue on my figure here, this time around I sent 20, 21, 22, 23, and 24, and 25.
Now I have three duplicate acknowledgements. But before that, let's see what would happen, right? So when I get the, so when I sent the packets here, so my window was like this, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, and 25. Right? An act came basically acknowledging packet number 20. So what, will, what would be my window at the time? Twenty six, right? My window will shift. It's acknowledging packet number twenty. So I can actually send out twenty six at this time. When the second acknowledgement, this guy came in, this acknowledged packet twenty one. So at the time my window will shift. And I'm also allowed to send 27 at the time. Right? So in response to this act, I would send out 27. Now this first duplicate act comes in. This is a duplicate act. My window will still stay at this. Packet 22 has not been acknowledged yet. So my left-hand side of the window will stay at 22. This duplicate act, again, window will stay at this, no change. It's not acknowledging 22. You cannot send anything new. This one, still the same, cannot send anything new. But this is the third duplicate act. So, a few things. I can do a fast retransmit now. So now, I can send out 22. Good. When this guy is received, still say 22. When this guy is received, still say 22, right? And let me go back here. I am already in fast retransmit here at this time, right? And if I go back to my state diagram, fast retrans sorry, fast retransmit and fast recovery here. So I'm actually in this stage right now. And for every duplicate act, I can win increase my window by one. But the problem says, ignore this part. So that, that's really what the, in, in, in the problem, there was a statement, increase, uh, ignore inflation of the window for duplicate acts or something. So this is exactly what it's talking about. Here, I'm getting extra duplicate acts for packets number 26, 27. In a real, real protocol, I could have in incre increased my window, but in this problem, we don't. Okay. And when I do fast retransmit, again, what will be my slow start threshold now? What was the window when the loss occurred? The window was six. Right? At this point, my window is still six. I haven't received all the acknowledgments. So my window is six. So this will be six divided by two, half of, well, this is three. Right? And at this time, Congestion window will also drop down to half, right? When I'm doing this guy, my congestion window will also drop down to half. And when 22 is received, 
the acknowledgement will come back and this is going to say give me 28 because 26 will be kept here and 27 will also be kept we are keeping out of sequence so when 22 is finally received it puts everything in sequence up to 27 so the acknowledgement is going to say give me 27 28 so now what we can consider here this is a bit of a you know it's real life condition window calculations will be a little bit more complicated but what we will say is okay here we sent three packets in this particular window we got three acknowledgements so i'm going to increase by one condition window will become four when i get this particular acknowledgement and now what i will do is i will send out four packets And this will be 28, 29, 30, 31. And according to the problem, these are all okay. So I'm going to get four acts back. 29, 30, 31, 32. So why? Congestion window will become five, and now I can send out five packets. 32, 33, 34, 35, 36. I will get back five acknowledgements. First guy will say, give me 33, then 34, then 35, 36, 37. And my condition window here will become six. Increase by one. And now I can send out six packets. Not very good drawing, but that's okay. I can send 37, 38, 39, 40, 41 and 42. Which packet was lost? 48. All right, thanks. So I will get back six acknowledgements here. It will say, give me 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43. My congestion window will be Right. So now I can send out seven packets. Forty three, forty four, forty five, forty six, forty seven, forty eight. How many? Six. And 49. Okay. So again, I, since there's a loss here, 48 will never reach. So this packet is lost. So it is good for us to uh, look at the window here when, when the whole thing starts. right? So it starts at 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49. This is the window right now. Right? So the first packet, 43, reaches the other side. The acknowledgement will come back and say, give me 44. When this act comes, my window can shift. Fifty. Sorry. Right? It's acknowledging a packet, so my window can shift. 
So now I'm allowed to send out packet number 50. And I'm going to do that. Acknowledgement for 44 comes back saying give me 45. So now my window will be 45, 46, all the way, 51. So if I had a 51st packet, I could send it. But in my problem, it's only 50 packets. Right? So no more. So this guy will say, give me 46. This one will say, give me 47. This will say, give me 48. Then 49 is never received. I'm sorry, 48 is never received. But for 49, it will say, give me 48. And let me try and continue drawing along the same line here. This is the first acknowledgement saying, give me 48. This is the first duplicate. And then when packet 50 is received, this will also say, give me 48. So that is the second duplicate. But then we are not sending anything anymore. So there's no third duplicate that's ever going to come. So somewhere around here, this was one round, so you know, one round trip time and another round trip time, two round trip times. There will be a timeout. And my congestion window will become one. And then here I will send out packet 48 and the acknowledgement for this is going to say give me 51 okay. so if I were to go back to my paper earlier and I continue drawing through this so up to 25 the next time around my window drop down to 3 and I sent 22, 26, and 27. Then it increased to 4, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, all the way up to 49. And the next time around here, I just sent 50. And the next time, I dropped down to 1. And I sent 48 again. Questions? Quiet day today, huh? Anyway. It's already 11.33, so I guess uh, we won't be doing problem two today. We'll uh, do that on Friday maybe and uh, yeah, pick up from where we left off today on Friday. Okay. So I'll see you guys again on Friday then in that case.